Hello everyone and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program 1.6 with Kerbalism and Real Solar System. In this episode I want to start working on landing a Kerbal on the moon. And again, it's the full-sized moon and we've only got stock parts. I have not added any new parts and the only change I did make was to increase the antenna range by a factor of 10. And I just did that for all parts across the board. It was just multiply by a factor of 10 and that's it. So other than that, the parts are still the same and we have a twitchy flag for some reason. I don't know why that happens, but it happens. This rocket is going to deliver some commsats into orbit because it seems like the ground stations that I'm used to for a real solar system are actually tied to remote tech. I'm not entirely sure about that, but um, I could have sworn that without the remote tech plug-in, it still had the extra ground stations, but anyway, let's just be sure and put some commsats up. This has two of them, but I don't know if I've done that right because I'm not used to the stock way of having the interstage trusses and all that business, so we'll see whether I've got that set up properly or not. Otherwise, um, I'm starting to rely on the stage recovery to recover things, so we've got parachutes on these boosters, and we'll see how much we get back for them. And the boosters have skiff engines at the, oh sorry, Reliant engines, I threw away the skiffs and went with Reliant engines. And then there's a mainsail core. The mainsail core we are not recovering this time. And then there are two of the, whatchamacallit engines, cheetah engines on the upper stage. And then there's the satellites which have the ant engines. So anyway, we will see how it works. Hopefully this can deliver stuff to orbit. Let me make sure that we're not totally out of line with the moon. That's important. Well, we are totally out of line with the moon, so let's time warp a bit. The satellites are very small. Hopefully they will be sufficient. We'll see. They are not going to geosync. I'm just tossing them reasonably high up. Okay, throttle up, SAS is on, and launch. Well, we're going up. Oh, I forgot about the plumes. I think uh, somebody said I need to reinstall real plumes. That might be the thing. So, maybe before the next launch I'll do that. I had forgotten about that. There's a lot to remember. Oh, there's only 20 electric charge. Well, we've got solar panels on each of the satellites. It's just not great to have so little. Should have added batteries. It's just uh, Provodobodyne Octos plus solar panels plus an engine plus comms. I don't know if having so little electric charge is gonna hurt the ability ability of these things to function as communication satellites. We'll see. Uh, uh, where's the oh the mainsail plume is all the way down here. This is rough. I put fins on because of all the Reliance engines and the fact they don't gimbal. Okay, separation. Well, at least they went away fine. And we'll see whether or not they are going to be recoverable. Now just the mainsail. There were fuel lines from the boosters to the mainsail stage, so it's starting off basically full. Oh, uh, contract fail. We got a lot of these those were because of the switch to RSS. Let's see if we get stage recovery confirmations or not. Oh, uh, recovered. Yes, we got stage recovery. And for each of those boosters, we got 5,000 it looks like. No, uh, 4,470 out of 5,000. I only put enough parachutes to get to a terminal velocity of about 8 meters per second. On the lunar rockets, we're going to have a lot of parachutes <laughs> trying to recover those pieces, so. Is it a little cheaty? Yes. But, you know, we're dealing with the stock rules here, so. Well, I mean, you know, heavy tanks and everything else, so let's mitigate the horror of it. Okay, staging. Ooh, that's rough. Thrust weight ratio on this is not good. Let me pitch up a little bit more even. All right, let's dump the upper fairing. Ooh, 
So this is a little bit complicated. There's another satellite in here with fairings around it, but I'm not entirely sure I've done this right. If this is the Honest Delta V, we're all right. If it's not, then the little satellites are gonna have to make orbit individually. Okay, actually the time to apoapsis is getting a little bit out of hand and since unlike in realism overhaul there's no problem restarting the engines, I'm going to restart the engines and coast to apoapsis to improve our situation. Oh, but I have to watch out for comms because we haven't got the commsats up yet. Very important. We're communicating through Baikabanur. Which is like where? Where are the ground stations in this version then? But it's going through Jewel Relay. So we're communicating how exactly? Through something around Vesta? Bouncing back? Is, is that what's happening? Well, this will deorbit, that's fine. Okay, so... Let's be careful about getting them individually to orbit, decouple. Okay, well, all right, it's been stabilized. <laughs> I'll take it. Okay, let's get these commutrons out. We do want to get it to a reasonably high orbit, so we're going to keep burning for a bit. Then again, let's go back to the other probe and get it. Oh, we lost communication already. Uh-oh. Oh, no electric charge. Well, right, because it was shrouded in... Wow, boy, it took electric charge really quickly, didn't it? Well, I guess we'll just proceed with our lunar prep. See how those rockets work. Well, actually, it's the same launcher for each of the missions. I'll get real plume back in and see if that fixes the plumes or not. And then we will launch the test of those. Each of those has a probe core just in case for testing purposes. And some of the parts are going to be uncrewed anyway. Well, I'll just take whatever at this point. All right, that's as high as it gets. Nearly 4,000 kilometers by 2,304. That's only a two hour and 34 minute orbit. Always surprises me. Anyway, let's orient normal. That'd be best for the solar panels. Okay. All right. Well, yep. Let's uh, do some lunar launches. Okay, so we're just going to proceed with the lunar landing mission elements, even though we only got one satellite launched. And this is the transfer vehicle for the lunar lander. It's only partially filled. So it's a transfer stage using a Cheetah engine and of course it has RCS ports for docking with the lander and solar panels for waiting for docking with the lander. Now because I upped the antenna range by a factor of 10, it looks like the Probodobodyne Octo and Hex should have enough uh, range, well certainly around low Earth orbit, uh, but even up to the moon. So that's interesting. Uh, it's a factor of how they decide to make the gap between the satellite uh, dishes that uh, despite that, uh, this relay antenna, which is the heaviest that we have, only ha states a range up to, say, Jupiter-ish. Uh, so we still need to unlock the bigger ones to get beyond Jupiter. So, yeah, I mean, it seems like multiplying by 10 is right, even though we get to have moon missions without a separate antenna. But we'll see. We'll see whether that works or not. One other question I had was whether Kerbalism was reading in 6-hour days or 24-hour days. It seems like it's 24-hour days as the system is because it says 2 days 11 hours here. So we're good with that. And that's important, obviously. I don't want to mess that up. And you can see we're using the same launcher, the big launcher that we had from the last video, except this time I want to recover the boosters and the core. You can see I've slapped lots and lots of parachutes on them. I don't know if that's gonna work or not. 
Uh, that brings them to 7.8 meters per second, 7.64 to the core there. And so we'll see whether we get enough back for that. Uh, otherwise, the launch is 335,000. The launch, there's two other elements, the lander and then the return vehicle. And each of those is also about the same cost. So we're talking about a million dollar mission, million fund mission, except we have to refuel this and it depends. The stage that brings the lunar lander up, this one right here basically, uh, could still have some leftover fuel to refuel the transfer stage and then we could do it like that. Or we might have to launch another one of these in order to finish off refueling this, in which case it's going to be, well, it's going to take four and that's going to be a cost of 1.3 million altogether. So that's the idea. Anyway, let's see if this works. At least this is the simplest one. And, you know, we're risking the least on this particular launch as far as testing the system. It might need to use its own fuel to finish orbit. We'll see. And this is the staging. Yeah, because normally I budget 9,500. This only is 9,153. So we'll see about that. Oh, I auto strutted the. Oh God, this this. Uh oh no no no. Okay, I don't know what happened. Uh, I need to add struts. I I'm I'm calling a foul on that. That was a bug. Um. Allow reverting flights. Wait, wait, gotta. Um, yeah. That's a bug. I'm not gonna pay for that. That's nonsense. I had auto strutted this to heaviest part, but um, obviously that was not good enough. Let's add strut connectors. This is where Kerbal Joint Reinforcement is really helpful and actually is required for realism overhaul. So, But we don't have that here right now. Mm, it's not the nicest strut I've ever placed. Okay, it seems like the struts are good. The flag is still jittering like crazy. Let's check out the plumes. So I replaced real plumes with the latest real plumes. We'll see if that helps at all or not. Okay, that should do the trick. It's not wiggling too much. All right, throttle up and launch. Well, the center engine plumes are fine, the outer engines aren't, so I'm gonna have to find some other solution for that. Again, I haven't changed the engines at all, so it beats me why the plumes should be in the wrong place. I'm using real plumes and uh, real plume stock configs. I thought I read in the comments somebody saying that they just uh, reinstall real plumes and that fixed it, but maybe I read that wrong. Maybe should have done some crossfeeding. I don't know if that's feasible or not. That probably would leave the core too low on the thrust to weight ratio. One question is whether the core is going to get too far out to be recovered by stage recovery. It's possible. I don't think stage recovery likes recovering stages just with parachutes when you have 2,000 meters per second or more. Okay, mainsail separation. Okay, hopefully they don't hit each other. It's really close. Maybe I could do some fuel cross-feeding into this. This thrust weight ratio is 1.7 right now. And the reason I didn't use a fairing here is because I didn't have the 3.75 meter fairing unlocked. So, that was unavoidable. Okay. Alright, that's fine. We've gone all blue again. That's okay. Okay, separation. Oh yeah, we're gonna need the 
fuel up here to actually finish things off. So the launcher can basically toss up 15 tons and it's about 900 tons on the launch pad which is a horrible ratio. But that's what the heavy tanks get you. And the heavy engines, the dry mass of everything is really heavy. And we haven't unlocked nuclear engines yet, if you're wondering. Oh, we've lost communication. Well, maybe I should just launch with KOS. Well, I need to add KOS first. I don't know if I can shut down the engine. Well, that was my fault on the communication. This might become a communication satellite at this rate. Eventually, this is gonna go on escape, so that's not good. Great. Yeah, it's on escape now. Well, we have our first interplanetary probe, accidentally. Okay, well, I think I should launch some more satellites. Um, yeah, yeah, let's launch some more satellites before we try and do this. This was obviously jumping the gun a bit. Okay, well, plus side, it looks like we recovered some stages. Also, we entered the orbit of Mars, world's first milestone, I don't know. Um, stage recovered, it looks like 21,000 for a stage value of 24,000. That's one, basically we recovered about 140,000 funds. So that cuts that launch down to about uh, less than 200,000. So that's good. Yeah. We can't really recover the core very easily. And in with the stock tanks, the stock fuel tanks actually cost a lot. Unlike in Realism Overhaul, the, stock, the Realism Overhaul tanks hardly cost anything at all. So the engines are really important. So the whole idea of recovering just the engine cost cluster makes sense in real life and in Realism Overhaul. But in stock, with the stock parts, not as much because the tanks actually cost a fair bit. Mm -hmm. This time I just have to remember to release the fairings over the shielded satellite. Oh, you know what? Let me put some more electric charge. Let me roll this back. Let me put some electric charge. Okay, here we go. SAS on. Throttle is up. Let's see if we can get two satellites this time. Time and launch. <laughs> the flames. I swear. So, Reliance are messed up. The mainsail is messed up. I don't know. Okay, and set. I wanted to hang on to them for just a little bit for the sake of the fins. That's quite a distance. Nice flame otherwise. Just a bit standoffish. Well, it's times like these where you wish you could toss up 60 communication satellites the way SpaceX intends to do. If it's Starlink. Though that's not really for space communications, it's not like a TDRS system, but still. The problem with that is not just the fact that we can't physically launch that many because it's too heavy, it's also because of, you know, the keeping track of all the communications and it causing lag because we have too many craft in orbit and all that business. It would just add way too much lag. I wish we would, didn't have to think twice about having, like, a lot of craft in orbit. That would be fun. Okay. Well, we are in orbit on that stage. That's excellent. Just a uh, perfect little orbit. Okay. Uh, let's separate off this fairing. That's good. Alright, so that'll be powered. Okay, let's set, separate off the first probe. And it is off with a bit of a spin. Okay, uh, well, the decoupling here is going to be a little bit touchy. Boink. Uh, all right. So, can we switch to it, please? No. Yes. Uh, this way. Boop, boop, boop. SAS on. Not that way. This way. Right. Oh, uh, what? Do we not have control? We do. <laughs> that is a little bit awkward. Let's not, not pay too much attention to that. 
All right, and let's get this one's commutrons out now. Okay, we'll situate this one first. So the first satellite that we had launched is over here. I think this is a good time to boost this up to a three hour orbit. We'll just match the other one's orbit since it, we have the same amount of fuel, of course. Now we sidestep, so hopefully we're not ramming into that. Yeah. Well, let's go shy of that orbit for now, and let's see if we can position this in a good place. Okay, so that's done. And we can orient this normal. For optimal solar exposure, and we've got the last one to do. Honestly, maybe a geosynchronous satellite would have been a good idea after all. Might still be a thing. But we're we're uh, learning a few things here. So yeah, this looks... Oh, that one is light behind. Anyway, this looks like a good enough position. Okay, well, we have three commsats. We might need more. But we'll take this for now. Okay, um, let's try that uh, launch again. This time without a few of the parachutes on the core. And we'll see what happens. Okay, so just for reference, as far as the relative inclination is concerned, basically a rocket can correct a few degrees on launch. So at this point, with uh, seven degrees left, we can take a look at where our commsats are to sort of optimize the situation. Well, we've got one over us in a reasonably bad place. <laughs> I guess it's got to go, uh, by the time we get over here, it's got to be all the way out there. So we don't want that one. We want one that's just coming up over the west coast when we launch, and that'll be good. Okay, this will be good. I hope. All right, so I took off the parachutes on the core. I've also added um, fuel lines from the boosters to the core, which improves efficiency. But the core only has a 0.99 thrust weight ratio when they decouple. Now that's probably going to be when we're going through max Q, so we're going to have to be very careful about that. We don't have fins or anything, so we'll see. It will improve the recoverability factor for the boosters, of course. And that flag again. All right, here we go. Launch. At least the Rhino engines are okay. I don't know why. I could probably fix it. I'll have to take a look at the configuration files and everything. Not high on my to-do list, to be honest. So in the midst of trying to do a landing on the moon with the stock parts, I'm actually working on a Apollo 11 50th anniversary extravaganza. There will be commemorative videos uploaded to YouTube uh, and that will have the original audio. I'm syncing the original audio together and I'll have other things, other little historical tidbits, but I'm also planning a live stream at the right timing. I'll try and release the videos so that you can play them, you can plan to you know, watch them at the correct time if you'd like. There are other things you could be watching that would do the same thing. I think the person behind Apollo17.org is doing one for Apollo 11, and that would be good. If you can get that together. He was also involved in the Apollo 11 movie, so he's got a lot more stuff than I do. Okay, I think we are through max Q by the time that we start separate. The 
doesn't mean it's a shoe in to avoid flipping, but... Okay, they are off. And actually, they're further apart this time, which is nice. So technically, it gave us more Delta V to do it this way, but... You know, we're gonna get extra gravity losses because of the thrust to weight ratio. And also drag losses because we're spending more time in the lower, at well, more time in this part of the atmosphere, I should say. Yeah, we probably have to keep up a little bit more of an angle. This stage still has two and a half minutes to go. The next stage isn't great on delta V, and the stage after that is worse. Not delta V, thrust to weight ratio. Communications is looking good. Okay, next. I don't think we'll quite make orbit on just the launcher stages, but we'll get close. Much closer than last time. And staging. Now the Wolfhound. And again, this stage has the cheetah on it. And we still will need this fuel. Just a bit. This is just the nose cap that gets dumped off. We need the docking port there. We end up having to put this higher up, but that'll be fine for rendezvous. I need to put it higher up just to give the engines time to do their thing. Communication is fine. Our third satellite is way out though, but I guess they'll probably wobble. I didn't put them in very precise orbits, so eventually that one will come around into a better location. We'll just have to pay attention to them. Let's check. Uh, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Six boosters recovered on the low ping satellite launch, which is was supposed to be. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven recovered, but one destroyed on the... Oh, but that's not the... Maybe I'm miscounting. That's the core that got destroyed, so... I think we got all the boosters from the from this launch. Okay, I'm gonna thrall down, separate, separate. And we want to actually do a maneuver to get rid of the nose cone. Okay, nose cone. Flick. Okay, prograde please. Got a bit of a relative inclination to the moon. Not exactly what I wanted, but I'll take it for now. Okay, let's keep it right there. That's in orbit. Um, so 14.3 tons in orbit. That's not great for that launcher, but if it does what it needs to do, that'll be fine. Let me round out this episode by completing the refueling of this, I guess. So I'm going to launch another one of these and then rendezvous it with this. And then we'll be good to go. We'll have a stage that can transfer a lunar lander to the moon. Then next time we will launch the lunar lander. Okay. At this point, the inclination is getting away from us because we're just launching right after the previous launch. So we're pretty much lined up. We just need to correct a little bit along the way. So here we go. Launch. Hopefully there's not going to be any unnecessary drama. The satellites are still overhead. So, yep. That's the nice thing about being able to get the rockets out immediately without any of the Kerbal Construction Time nonsense. Of course. There's sort of a little bit of skew for some reason. Okay, booster is set. Well, even at this angle, the time to apoapsis is going down, so let's just hold it right here. Well, okay, a little bit lower to follow the prograde vector. 
We might do better just with having less fuel on this stage. Maybe that tank gone. Sometimes trading Delta V. I mean, it's a marginal marginal amount of Delta V, right? Because you get most of the bang for your buck from the first tank, and then if you add an additional tank, it's not quite as much. It might be better to get the thrust to weight ratio. This was configured without the fuel cross feeding. Now with that, we are fuel cross feeding. Changes things a little bit. Inclination looking good. Okay, separation and ignition. We went uh, a little bit steeply this time, and it does not seem to have helped, so... I think we should just uh, launch a little bit shallower than this time. I'm always worried about control because the stock engines don't have the gimbling that real-life engines do. Except the Vector. <laughs> Except something that has 8 degrees of gimbal. They generally don't gimbal very much. Okay, next. Okay, now I didn't leave any time to apoapsis, darn it. Okay, nope, we need that too. Oh, okay. All right. With the lander, its uh, upper stage should be able to transfer a bit more fuel to the transfer stage. So we are obviously going to be not quite fully fueling it with this launch. So this is in a slightly higher orbit. And we're going to let the other one... Well, we'll probably let this one run. It doesn't really matter, does it? Uh, we'll see. Uh, but the other one is going to have to go all the way around to catch up and I'll start recording again once it does that. Oh, we just had uh, our first Kerbalism failure. Yay. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, it's on this one. Okay, stage recovered. Fine, 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 fine. Lots of stages destroyed too, though. We escaped the gravitational influence of Earth accidentally, yes. Okay, um, log. RCS failed on, is that this one or the other one? I mean, we have, uh, it's on this one. It's this block. Well, you know. Okay, we currently have a closest approach distance of 7.8 kilometers. And, well, that says 7.335, but... Not exactly what I really, really wanted, but we'll take it for now. Fortunately, as far as rendezvous are concerned, everything around the Earth is far more patient. The key thing is to not have a huge relative inclination. That's a problem. But other than that, you can take your time. It does take a lot of time. I mean, if you're in a rush, then that's not great. Let's just see... well, we don't have a whole lot of communication support right now. And we just lost communication. Well, good thing we still had a standoff distance. I'm hoping to reserve enough RCS to deorbit this, but I'm not sure. Fortunately, still the stock docking ports with stock magnetism. Everything's got plus sides and minus sides. We have a satellite directly above us, and presumably it's communicating with something. Probably, I don't know, the horizon doesn't seem great for that desert launch center. That should be good enough, right? Yep. Okay. So let's transfer some fuels. All right, well, we'll have to hope that that's enough. So this is empty of those. It has a bit of RCS. Let's see if it can deorbit itself with that. Now, if I had been really fancy, of course, I would have uh, 
would have put parachutes on and tried to recover it. Well, and a heat shield. You know, that's too fancy, obviously. Way too fancy. That seems to be a good deorbit right there. We'll follow it down just for the explosions. So let's see. But yep, yeah, it should definitely be disposed of. Successful mission to refuel that transfer stage. Now we're going to have to get the lander to it. Get the lander into orbit around the moon. And then we can launch a Kerbal in the return vehicle, which will rendezvous with the lander. And then the Kerbal will go down to the surface. Maybe I should test the lander ahead of time, but then we have to do all this again. I don't know. Solar panels has, have survived down to 96 kilometers so far. Very red around here for some reason. All the colors are strange these days. I mean, I guess because the atmosphere around Kerbin doesn't even start until 70 kilometers, these solar panels survive for a while. But then the velocity, you would think, would destroy them. I don't have fair mirror space to tell me how much dynamic pressure... Oh, there we go. We lost them at 62 kilometers, 63 kilometers. There's important information right now. Look at it. Could it possibly have survived with just uh, tucking in the solar panels and then putting some parachutes? I don't know if stage recovery would have been happy with it, but the answer seems to be yes. So this is important information for the future. I guess this is because we haven't added real heat. The heat tolerances on all this stuff are probably obscenely high compared to what they ought to be. So we'll see if litho braking helps. I doubt it. Not at this speed. Nope, all destroyed. All right, and with that, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.